Yeah, we're almost there, guys. I think I'm like the second to last person, so thanks for everybody's uh, continued participation. I know that we've had a lot of presentations today. Um, so my project, hydrograph separation in the Chilean Andes, and I put in there, and the importance of rock glaciers. So I'm going to talk a lot to you guys um, in the next 15 minutes about rock glaciers um, and why you should care about them and why everybody should care about them. Um, so I've kind of an overview of my presentation. So first I'm going to talk about motivations, um, why this matters, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the previous work that's been done on this. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm currently doing. Um, I've been here since September, uh, so my presentation is going to be a little different than everybody else's. I'm actually more than halfway there. Um, and so, yeah, the last month has been a lot of field work, and hopefully not all this is super polished, but uh, hopefully maybe we'll get some data up there. Um, so, what is a rock glacier? I'm sure a lot of you are probably asking that. Um, and so, kind of more technical definition. Uh, so, it's something of periglacier, which just means like related to, you know, what we think of when we talk about glaciers, the big blocks of ice. Um, but also cryogenic, so related to permafrost um, origin. I put both of those because there's not a real big consensus in the literature on that. Um, you can dive into the body of rock glacier literature and um, after like a week you've read most of the papers. Um, there's not a huge body of literature. It stretches back into the 70s, but it's pretty isolated. Um, so again, what is it? So it's basically uh, completely covered by rocks um, and deposits, which, but it's still thicker. The, the rocks and deposits are thicker than maybe a covered glacier, which you may or may not be aware of. Um, and on the inside, it's a mix of rock and ice. Um, and so there's active ones that flow like glaciers, um, but there's also inactive ones that basically a pile of rocks where there's ice in there, um, and they don't move. So I've got a nice picture here, um, highlighting a couple of different, um, kind of actually the whole family of glaciers here. Um, it's also cool because this is at the kind of the top of my study site. But in the purple, uh, we have the Depilo Glacier, um, and so that's like what most people I think associate with glaciers, it's a huge mass of ice, you can see kind of with the relief from Google Earth, it's kind of like draping down, um, and so it snows up top here, and then that's the accumulation zone, and then as it kind of moves its way downhill, um, that's, this is where it's losing, and then here um, we get a transition, so the orange uh, is a covered glacier, um, and so if you like walk up next to that, right, you can see it looks rocky, but if you like touch it, there's ice on the side, right? So there's like rocks on top. Um, and as you notice, we're going lower in elevation. That's because the rocks protect it from the sun. Um, and you've got, you know, you can see these like flow lines, right? You can see kind of these bends. Um, you can see them up here as well, right? Because they're moving. Um, then as we kind of go from there, we get to the rock glaciers here at the toe. Um, it's kind of cool too because we have both the glacial origin here, right? Obviously this is turning into that, it's turning into this. Uh, but we also have the Perry Glacier. Over here we've got another rock glacier uh, that's got an accumulation zone. Um, you know, you've got mobilized permafrost is what's happening here. But it's not really, you know, there's not this big ice glacier at the top turning into a covered glacier. You just kind of have the generation of a rock glacier all on its own. Um, and so two schools of thought, I think both are probably right, but they'll argue all the time. Um, and that's one of the, where I've got some data actually, but that's kind of covering the of, you know, how they form, why they, um, and this is another image just highlighting the flow lines. So this is again the, you know, if you start with an ice glacier, go to a covered glacier, end up in rock glacier, but you can see these flow lines, um, and that's actually how they kind of the inventories are made. Um, and then over here we've got just a full on rock glacier, um, but you again highlighting kind of the flow lines, and here's kind of just a idealized, you know, how that evolution could happen, right? You've got rocks in there as the ice is melting. Um, there's more rocks, less ice, and then, but you suddenly you get this cap on top, and so that preserves some of the ice. Um, and in here we've got mix ice and rock. Um, so why are they so important? Um, so in Chile specifically, between 29 and 34 south, um, so that's like the whole central region where most of the population is. Um, there's more ice in rock glaciers uh, than in um, regular glaciers. Uh, they're smaller in size, but they're bigger in extent. Right? There's a lot more of them. Um, and so, just highlighting, you know, near Santiago, we look out to the mountains, it's kind of hazy, but 10% um, of the terrain between 3,500 and 42,000 meters um, is covered by rock glaciers, which means that they're a fundamental part of the hydrological network, because even if the water's not generated there, one-fifth of all the drainage is going to pass through there at some point. Um, 
And so in the absence of snow, along with you know, our traditional glaciers, um, they've, some studies have shown that it contributed up to 70%, 67% of the MIPO uh, is water, right? And that's the like 90 some percent source of water for the city of Santiago. So, uh, and I kind of highlight that, there's little to no protections for rock glaciers legally. Um, Chile has been going through this like tumultuous process of creating a glacier law. It's been like going on, they've, uh, it's been rechazado seven times. Uh, and so they're still working on it, but within that, right, it's really complicated because what is a glacier, right? So is it a rock glacier or is it just an ice glacier? Are we protecting just the big white ones or are we protecting also the ones that are piles of rubble, more or less, right? Um, so thought that was important. Um, so from previous studies, so what about these guys? You know, uh, I'm trying to figure out how much water they contribute to rivers, but um, from you know, the work that's been done, what, what characterizes the water that comes from a rock glacier? So there's few direct observations, right? Because it's hard and impossible in most cases to get a direct like measurement because it's covered by rocks. Um, and so what studies we do have though, let us know that the water is usually very cold, you know, less than 1.5 degrees Celsius, so it's pretty cold. Um, high in conductivity, I'm glad that you brought up conductivity earlier. It's um, really high. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so 100 to 500 micro siemens, uh, that's a weird unit, but basically it gives you a good idea of how much um, suspended, uh, how much nutrients in the water or just dissolved um, constituents. Um, and, but they're also, they're low in suspended sediments, so the water is generally clear um, and that there's some numbers there. But another thing kind of highlight is that they, I found a study that shows that they might have high heavy metals. Uh, so sometimes, like when you read about rock glaciers, everyone's like, "Oh, it's like the untapped water source. Like we have so much water in the mountains, it's all good." But like it could be high in heavy metals, so you know that's important for drinking and also for farming. Um, so here's a picture. It's in black and white, but it's not that old. This is like the idealized, right? You've got this rock glacier, this little stream coming out of it, and bam, we've got science happening. Um, that's like never the case when you're studying rock glaciers. This is one of like two studies where they're like, "Look, there it is." There's the water. Um, and so a lot of the studies, all you know, I've been talking about how there's so much ice in there. Um, how they turn that into stream flow is kind of just like a rough mathematic um, process, right? Because they can, through, they've done some coring um, and also uh, geophysical studies to figure out like, how much ice is really in these things. Um, but then when you go from that to like, okay, how much of that ice is melting and going into the rivers? Um, really, the major body of work that kind of ca accounts for those contributions um, is basically based off this chart this one guy made, and it's basically, you know, here are your different types of glaciers, the factor of production, just a percent, you know, and you multiply by how big they are. And so it's like an ice glacier, 0.64, you know, liters per second per hectare, um, and an inactive rock glacier, 0.02, right? But you're basically just taking, like, a number, multiplying it by the, by the area. Um, which, when we talk about you know seasons, just knowing that is accounted kind of for in here. We talk about you know geographic difference. None of it. It's just kind of so that's kind of a big, I guess, impetus for why uh, you know carry out this work. So kind of capping all of that. Um, so rock glaciers they're hard to measure. Um, the ice is covered up. The melt is often subterranean. Right? I showed you the picture of the exception. We've got this nice little stream coming out of it, but a lot of times it's not the case. Um, so we've got few direct observations, um, and the current geographic methods are simple, um, and they show potential contributions. Um, good thing is they show how much, they can tell you how much ice is actually there, but we don't actually know how much that ice is melting, um, and how much of that is entering into, uh, we've got our nice little image of the hydrologic cycle, right? We don't know how much of that is making it into the hydrologic cycle. Um, so, my work, the idea, so can we use temperature? Um, temperature is a cheap measurement. Uh, it's easy to take, um, and so kind of some of the background ideology, I guess, if you will, for this is that in alpine streams, there's some studies that show that temperature is really heterogeneous, right? Um, and the main controls on temperature are going to be the discharge, which is basically just flow, how much water is in uh, the river, uh, the geomorphology, so how the landscape shapes the river and how the river shapes the landscape, um, and the distance from the headwater source. And so our dominant controls. Um, is mainly solar radiation, the energy coming from the sun. And um, then we've got our advective inputs, which just means we're adding more water um, of a different temperature, right? So that's going to change your temperature in the stream. 
Um, and that comes from groundwater, uh, from tributaries. We've got rock glaciers in red there because um, that's a study that was kind of looking at the direct impact of rock glaciers on the thermal heterogeneity of little streams. So hopefully I've convinced you that yes, we can use temperature, right? Because it, it varies depending on the source. Um, it's cheap and easy to use, right? And we can't get to the, the ice in the rock um, without drilling, which is really expensive. So yeah, why not? Let's measure the temperature of a bunch of streams, try and figure out where the water's coming from. Um, so uh, that kind of brings me to the work I've been doing now. Uh, this is the field site. That's why I've been here since September. This is like right around here and everything is up from there. Right around here is at 4,000 meters. And so in a month, two months, like it's going to be the roads you can't get up there anymore. Um, and so we've got, um, it's a cool natural lab, right? It's the buzzword scientists like to use. Um, but we've got, right, earlier I was showing you, you know, the family of glaciers over here. And that, that kind of feeds a stream. Then we've got, um, and the, the different colors are from an inventory um, that one of my colleagues has been working on. And so over here in the next, you know, we've got basically a hand, right? And each one of the fingers has different contributing sources. So this one's got all of them. We've got glaciers, rock glaciers, inactive rock glaciers, active rock glaciers, covered glacier, the whole gamut, very complicated. Um, this one, right, we still have a little tiny glacier up here, uh, but it's mainly, you know, we've got this big uh, active rock glacier, some inactive ones feeding into here. Then we come over here, and we've just got this little baby rock glacier way at the top. Um, yeah fourth finger and then over here um, we've got another one with some small rock glaciers and then this one over here has nothing right but well, there's still water so where does it come from the ground um, and so I've got temperature sensors uh, in each one of these in, in, in the main stream here where they start joining up I've got multiple temperature sensors uh, there's a well that there's temperature sensors in the well as well so we can get the groundwater signal and there's also some um, a good set of weather stations uh, that let me know what the Sun is doing uh, here's a picture of how that looks. Um, we've got the little, you know, here's my little computer thing. And then you've got basically a meat probe um, and a long cable with a metal tip on it. And that's measuring the center of the stream. Everything's covered with rocks so it doesn't get eaten by guanacos or uh, mules or anything. You know, they like that actually happened. They chewed up one of the cables. Um, and so that's taking our temperature. Um, characterizing solar radiation. Um, so I'm working with some different data sets here, you can see the streams again. This is just kind of pictures of what I was actually doing this week. Um, but this is in ArcGIS, and um, I'm calculating the geometry from digital elevation maps. Um, so that's going to let me know, like, okay, this point on the ground is getting this much sun, taking the numbers from the solar radiation station. Yeah, you guys get the idea. Um, and the kind of zoomed in is I've got my hands on it, like, this is 12 meter resolution. You can't really see anything, right? Here, this is like 0.5 meter resolution. Um, so I've been trying to work with that data set. Um, it's obviously a lot larger because it's much higher resolution. Um, and so I've been doing that. And then the other thing we need to do, and I've been working on, is characterizing the stream properties. Um, and so what that looks like is we've got a bucket. Uh, you put a little bit of salt in there. You mix it with water. You weigh the salt really well. Um, and then you just throw that in the stream. Um, and then you're measuring conductivity. Um, and I've actually been doing that at several points. Uh, and you get a graph that looks like this. Um, and so as you put salt in the water, conductivity goes up. Uh, but then as that pulse goes through, it kind of goes back to the background rate. You can integrate that, take the area underneath the curve, um, and that gives you the volume of water that that salt's been diluted into. It gives you the volume of water in the stream. That's discharge, one of our super important um, characteristics that's going to get us you know, control, a control on temperature. Other important uh, characteristic you can get from this um, I'm working on, you know, if you have this at several points, you can tell how that pulse has changed from when you put it in the stream to where it got to. Um, and so I'm going to try and run that through some models and get some more stuff like the area of the stream, which is important because the area controls how much sun is getting in, right? And that's 88% of um, our heat budget there. So we need to know with high, you know, certainty how wide the stream is. Um, and I can go way more into detail on the more technical stuff. If anyone has any questions, I've got some extra slides at the end, but I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, and so I've got some acknowledgments. Thank you all for being here. Um, I've got the Fulbright Commission, obviously, for allowing us to have this experience. Um, I'm working with James McPhee uh, at the University of Santiago, and then I'm also working with SASA, uh, the Centro de Estudios Avanzados en Zonas Arias, 
Um, and of course, that first picture was all the people I've been going to the field with, and without them, you know, I couldn't do any of this. So thanks to all of them. And um, yeah, there's some sources. Any questions?